Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And I'm so excited today, Bryce. We're going to talk about Easter. We're going to talk about Jesus. Now, normally when we talk about Easter, it's the victory over death. It's Jesus's resurrection and the victory over death. But it hasn't been too long. A couple weeks ago, Mike and I did a podcast on 2 Nephi chapter 9, and we spent a lot of time on the fact that Jesus overcomes the awful monster. And anyway, we'd refer all of you back to that podcast. And rather than just kind of rehashing that, Let's just talk about him. Let's talk about who is this man and why do we love him so much? I I know Easter's a focus on his resurrection, but I just would love to point out all the aspects and stories and the insights that make him who he is. If resurrection is his crowning achievement, then let's talk about his character, his personality, and all those wonderful things that he did. So why don't you start us off, Mike? So I just got done watching an account of The Woman of the Well that just blew me away. And it's the eighth episode of The Chosen. And what I like about it is it takes a little bit of artistic license. You know, have you seen those, Bryce, those ones before where they, they just basically quote the scriptures? Yep. And, and not to mock them, but you they're know. They're safe and they're great. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you know, th- this one's really good. It, it has backstory in it. And it kind of gets into the backstory of this woman, the woman of the well. She's had five husbands. And I'm just going to read a couple of these verses. It's John 4. He purposely, in verse 4, says that he goes through Samaria, and he goes to Jacob's well in verse 6, and then he just starts talking to her and says, hey, will you give me something to drink? His disciples go to get food in town, and she's like, what are you talking to me for? You're a Jew. What are you asking me to, to give you something to drink? And then he says in verse 10, he's like, well, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for a drink. I'd give you living water. And then in verse 11, she calls him sir, and then she starts talking to him. But then later, she says in verse 19, she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. And the shift where she sees it is when he he tells her, why don't you go get your husband and we'll we'll sit and talk. And she's like, well, and she pauses and he says, that's right. You've had five husbands. You've had five husbands and the man you're currently with is not your husband. Yeah. And then she's like, okay, so you're a prophet. And then later he testifies to her that he's the Messiah. He is very open with her and he tells her. And the reason why I brought this up with VidAngel is their portrayal of of this price was just spectacular because she's a little argumentative and she's a little feisty. And it shows the history of these people. These Samaritans had a temple in Gerizim. And it's modern day Nablus today. And historically, that temple was destroyed about 100 years before Jesus. um, The Maccabees, who were really ticked at the Samaritans, um, came in and just tore it down. So imagine that this man who's from this culture that ripped down your temple is talking to you. And so and I love in the video where she's just kind of feisty and she's like, how dare you talk to me? You know, I don't like you guys. And he 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 basically says in the video, he's like, it isn't about where we worship. Let me tell you who my father is. He looks at her and he says, your first husband's name was this. And this is how you felt when you married him. And your second husband's name was this. And he smelled like oranges. And he was a holy man. He's the best man you've ever known. And after he's named the second husband to her, she's crying. And she's like, how do you know this? And he basically says, it's because I'm the Messiah. How do you think I came here to to this well at this time? I knew that you would be here. And she just says, I'm going to tell everybody who you are. And he's like, I know. That's why I came to you. And it's a beautiful story in John 4. Like a lot of this is artistic license. But in the text of John 4, she literally leaves her water pot. And she goes in verse 29 to the whole city, and she's like, I have found the Messiah. And the author of John 4 tells us that the entire city believed on him. That's in verse 39 and 40. And I like that as is who Jesus is. He's a person, he's real, and he knew her. And she's on the edge of what is considered proper, and he goes right to her, and then he speaks her language. And that's who I see him as. He's just a real person but he meets you where you're at. And I love... He's right there. I love this whole exchange as a great symbol for all of us because this woman goes in and says, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And they go out and listen to Christ himself. And then they come back and in verse 42, they say to the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, 
for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ. And I think that's the prayer of every parent and every teacher is to say, go find out for yourself. I just love this little exchange. And, and I, there's tension in the Gospels. There's some uh, Gospels that say you know, he doesn't speak to the Samaritans, and I get that, and I understand that. But in, in John's narrative, he goes right to him, and I think that tells me a little bit about who he is in the sense of the person that you know that maybe you think, okay, they wouldn't accept Christ. Maybe that's true. Maybe right now they wouldn't, but don't give up. God's not done with them. And of all people in this group— First of all, they hate the Jews. Second of all, she's on the edge of that group, and he goes right to her. Yeah. Powerful. That's a great example of who this man is. I'm going to take everyone to the woman with the issue of blood. All the, the three synoptic gospels all talk about her. Now, under the law of Moses, a woman with an issue of blood was considered unclean and couldn't touch anyone, or anyone who touched her was considered unclean and had to be ceremonially washed. And so this woman has a problem. She's had a 12-year issue, and that, you could, I mean, everyone just knows how desperate this woman has, is. She's been to doctor after doctor. No one's made her any better. They've made her worse. She's desperate, and then she hears of Christ. And this woman is a great woman of faith, and she says, look, I, I know he can heal me. Her problem is he can't touch her. She can't ask for a blessing. He can't lay his hands upon her, because if he does, he's considered unclean, and then he has to be ceremonially washed. So she comes up with the brilliant idea of just touching the hem of his garment, and then she'd be healed. Um, technically, I haven't touched him. I've just touched the hem of his garment. Now, the one thing you need to understand, hem of his garment, we kind of think that's like the cuff of your pants, but he would have had a little shawl that he wore with a little tassel that hang down. And so as he walked, he would have thrown that tassel over his shoulder. So the hem of his garment was actually in the middle of his back. It was hanging down his back. And so this woman thought, I know, I'm just going to sneak up behind Jesus and steal a blessing. And I wonder how many of us kind of have that same attitude. Is I, I know Jesus can heal me, but I'm not worthy, and if I touch him, you know, I'll make him unclean, so I'm just going to sneak up behind him and steal a blessing. And so she does. She, she, she comes through the crowd, and the second she grabs that tassel, she knows instantly she's been healed. Now, I want you to just picture the emotion in her heart this is a woman who after 12 years, she suffered for 12 years this disease. She hasn't been able to go to the temple. She hasn't been able to go to the synagogue. She's been an outcast. No one's helped her. After 12 years, she knows she's healed. Can you just imagine, imagine the exhilaration in her heart? That is Jesus. That is the Jesus we all hope he will be in our lives the Jesus of exhilaration, the Jesus that heals us and brings miracles into our lives. And then all of a sudden he says, who touched me? Now, tell me the emotion in her heart. Oh, no. I'm in, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I've done something wrong. He knows I made him unclean. And that, my dear friends, is the second Jesus. The Jesus we're worried he might be. The Jesus who knows every sin I've ever committed, who is clearly disappointed in me. So you got the two Jesuses right back to back. The Jesus we hope he is. The Jesus of exhilaration and thrill. The Jesus of healing. And then you've got the, oh no, I'm in trouble. I'll never be good enough. I don't live up. He clearly is mad at me. Why would he care enough to save me? And that's her, is in her head. Yeah. But not in his head, right? And so the question is, which Jesus is he? He's going to reveal to her and to all of us, which Jesus is this man? Those of you who have your dreams and your heart set and filled with hope that that everything's going to be okay, that healing's going to come, that miracles are going to come, that forgiveness is going to come, and resurrection is going to come. And yet your fear is that he knows so much about me, and clearly he's disappointed, and why in the world would he want to save me? So which one is he? So he says, who touched me? And she hides. Understandably so, right? She hides until he insists. 
and she can't be hid any longer. So fearing and trembling, she comes forward and announces that she was the one that touched him. And then one word, he reveals which one he is with one word. He simply says, daughter. He doesn't need to say anything else. That word tells you which Jesus he is. And I would suggest to all of us who struggle, I think, I think the Savior is someone we love and we're scared of at the same time. It's like the police. When I'm in danger, when there's an intruder in my house, nothing brings that feeling of safety better than the blue and the red lights out front. They bring safety. I'm, I'm excited to see that. But then when I'm driving in my car and I see the blue and the red lights behind me, it's terror. <laughs> I love my bishop, but then I get that phone call saying, hey, can I talk to you on Sunday? And it's terror. Your heart pounds. And Jesus is the same way. We love him with all our soul, and yet we're terrified of him. So which one is he? For all of you who've ever struggled with this and said, which Jesus is he? You need to hear that one word, daughter, or son, or child. And that word, and I know he said it with the utmost tenderness, is simply a declaration that he is the Messiah, that he will do all the things that we pray he will do. In spite of our imperfections, in spite of all the reasons we give him not to, he is that Jesus. Give us another one, Mike. So, Oliver Cowdery. Oh, I love that one. You going to Doctrine and Covenant 6? Yeah, let's do that. The night he struggled, the night he wanted to know an answer. I love what Jesus says to him. I, you know, and I kind of see this as it goes with the woman at the well. I mean, Jesus knew her. And section six of the Doctrine and Covenants, this is Oliver Cowdery, and he's just praying. He's like, what is the deal? Like, do I do what my heart tells me to do? And well, verse, you can imagine the claims he's been hearing yeah. from this young man are so out there. Totally. And he's actually contemplating joining him in this quest. He's got to be second-guessing himself, saying, what in the world am I thinking? Totally. I, I mean, how many people did you meet on your mission, Bryce, that joined the church, and you could see the struggle where they're like, my family's going to think I'm so weird. Yeah, they're going to disown me. I think half, you know, more than half of the membership of the church right now is first generation. I remember there was one lady on my mission that we taught that she was like, my heart tells me I'm I'm praying. She's had, she actually had dreams about us as missionaries, but she's like, people are going to think I'm so weird believing in stuff. That's like the book of Mormon. Like, how do I explain it? And so I can just imagine Oliver's trepidation. I love verse 15 of section six, where the Lord says, I did enlighten thy mind. Remember you know that I did enlighten your mind, and, and now I'll tell you these things that thou mayest know that thou hast been enlightened by the Spirit of truth. So he tells Oliver, you know, I, I've been talking to you this whole time. And then he says in verse 22, which is so powerful, where he says, Verily I say unto you, if you desire further witness, cast your mind upon the night that you cried unto me in your heart, that you might know concerning the truth of these things. Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? And what greater witness can you have than from God? Oliver didn't tell Joseph that I had a spiritual experience. And Joseph's getting this revelation for Oliver, and it's being written down, and Oliver's like, oh my goodness. Like, this is, this is real. How did you know? How did you know that? That's who he is. He knows, he knows his heart. He knows who he is. And not just who he is, but... He knows your experience, like he's in you. Let me throw in, in Luke chapter 7, that woman that comes to the Savior and weeping, clearly this is a sinner. And Jesus is, is, is sitting down to meet at Simon's house, and the Pharisee invites him in and doesn't treat him very well. And then this woman comes in weeping and washing his feet with her tears and wiping them with her heads and kissing his feet. And... Verse 39, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, I, I noticed that word it, when, when the Pharisee saw it, not her, it, when the Pharisee saw it, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. The only thing Simon could see was the outward behavior, the sin 
So Jesus rebukes him and says, I have somewhat to say in thee, say on. You know, he talks about two people owed this ma- this guy a lot of money. You know, one owed 50 and one owed 500. He forgave them both. Who will love him the most? Well, the one who forgave most. Thou hast rightly judged. And then 44, this is Luke seven forty four. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, four of my favorite words that came out of the mouth of Jesus. Seest thou this woman. That is such a contrast to Simon who saw the sin. Seest thou this woman. That's Jesus. What verse is it where it says it? I want to highlight that. Uh, Back in verse 39, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it. That's good. And Jesus says, seest thou this woman? And another example is the woman taken in adultery. We, let's do that. Is that let's John jump 8? there. John chapter 8. I like that word. He There's does that, that one phrase in there. He, he says that same thing. Here's a woman taken in adultery, and they're trying to trap Jesus. Who, you know, we should stone her. Who should stone her? And Jesus, first of all, it doesn't pretend he doesn't listen to them. And then he that is without sin should first cast a stone at her. And then they all walk away by their own guilt. Jesus was left alone with the woman. And then I love verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. Now, I know on the surface what that saying is, everyone else had left except for the woman. But I just love the, there's another undertone to that phrase. Jesus saw the woman, not the sin, the woman, the struggle, the heartbreak, everything she's been through. Jesus saw the woman. Doctrine and Covenants 46, verse 15, it says he suits his mercies according to the conditions of the children of man. He sees the person. Seest thou this woman? One of my favorite realities is that this dispensation began. The apostasy ended with one word, and it was the name of a young boy. That's how the apostasy ended. Joseph. I like where he Michael, says... Bryce. He, he says, remember when he says, I, I was just a boy of no consequence. Of no consequence. I'm nothing. But I was of consequence to God. Yeah. And I just, I, I, that's the Jesus that we worship. It's, seest thou this woman? And he saw none but the woman, and he didn't condemn her. He clearly says, go and sin no more. Sin is not acceptable. But he saw the person, the human being. That's the Jesus we worship. I have a testimony of that. I want to share like a personal experience about this. It's really personal. So I hope that this translates. Uh, but essentially it was many years ago. I had a, a person I had to work with and we, Bryce, don't we all have people like this in our life that are yep. just difficult? Yep. Um, We're all Nephi's with a layman in our life. And maybe in this case, I was the layman and he was the <laughs> Nephi. I think, you know, it depends on who you are and your perspective, but for me, I really that was really justified in my rightness. Have you ever felt that where you're working with somebody and you're like, well, I'm clearly right. Yeah. And I didn't like this guy. To suffice it to say, it was really hard. And it's a really long, drawn out story of just interactions where it just wasn't working and I really was struggling. And I remember one day I came home and I slammed the car door and I came in the in the house through the garage and my wife could see that I was uh, distraught. And I said, I just don't like this person. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I says, I, I don't know what to do. I have no answer. I literally, and I, <laughs> Bryce, you know me, a lot of times I'm quick with, hey, I have the answer. Listen to my, you know, here's my solution to whatever the problem is. And I just said, I, I, I was just literally empty. Have you ever had that where you're just like, I don't know what to do? And part of it is I don't want to. I want to wallow in my hatred and my anger. I don't want to forget. I don't want to see him any other way. Because well, I was right. Yeah. And he was what wrong. What he did to me was in- inexcusable, and I, I, want to wa- I want to hold on to that pain for a while. Yeah. I was totally in that space. And my wife, and maybe this is the bottom line is the message of this story, Bryce, is we should listen to our wives. <laughs> maybe that's the whole point. But in that day, I think my wife said one of the... She's very wise, but it was one of her wiser moments where she said, you know what you should do, Mike? And I'm like, no, I don't. And she says, you need to pray to Heavenly Father. 
to help him. To, or to, she didn't say to help him. She said to help you. And, but I think in my head, I thought she was saying to help him. And, um, you know, I learned a long time ago, you can't pray to God to ha- have God fix the other person. It, it's never worked that way with me. And so, I, you know, basically what I did was I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, help me figure this out. Help any way you can. I basically begged him to, to help me. And that night I had a dream. And in that dream, I was this person. Like I was in his skin and I had his emotions. It's been a long time ago, but it feels like it was yesterday. I could literally feel his emotions. I remember experiencing his childhood. I remember experiencing the pains and the insecurities about certain specific issues that I'm not going to mention here, but they were highly detailed. And I remember waking up at about three or four in the morning and I had been crying in my sleep and I'll never forget it. And that morning I woke up and I told my wife, this is what happened. And I described it to her. And what do you do with this? And I says, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it felt real. And what was interesting was it answered why he was doing the things that he was doing that were annoying me because I saw it from his point of view. I saw it from his perspective and I changed. Like he still did those behaviors, but because I got where he was at, I was able to work with him. And that's not the end of the story. Fast forward a, a, a while later, it was, it was a camp out we did with a bunch of the scouts and it was me and just a ton of leaders and a ton of boys. And I'm sure you've been on these scout camps, Bryce, you've raised boys, you, you know the drill. Yep. And we're on one of these camp outs and I never forget for somehow, some way I was in this guy's tent and it was just he and I, and it was late at night and we just started talking and you know where this is headed. You saw the man. We, yeah, I just started saying, Hey, tell me about your life. And for a good hour or two, he was telling me about his life and his experiences. And to this day, he doesn't know this, but I'm in a, a sleeping bag across the way in the tent and he's describing my dream. I was literally crying as he was describing this because I was like, holy cow, this is real. I was given a glimpse into who he was and I saw him the way the Savior saw him and he didn't change, but I did. And I tie this in to Alma 7. Are you okay to read that for us, Bryce? Alma seven eleven. Yeah, one of my favorites because this is, you know, sometimes we don't realize how much of an insight the Book of Mormon gives us into the Savior, but this is one of those. He shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And may I suggest that meant not only infinite in breadth, but infinite in depth. He not only broke his arm, but he's broken his arm in every possible way. So that no matter how I've ever broken my arm, he broke his arm the same way. He has suffered pains, afflictions, temptations of every kind. And this that the word might be fulfilled, which saith he taketh upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Every human experience, everything we've ever been through, he's familiar with. I don't understand why I had that dream. I didn't ask for that dream. I asked, help me to be better. Help me to get through this. But for me, I also just, I just believe this in my bones that Jesus knows who you are. Which tells us something about the more Jesus knows us one by one, the more he sees us, the more he knows us intimately, the more he loves us and understands us. I love that. That's the man that we love and that we worship. He knows us individually. I want to go to 3 Nephi chapter 11, Mike, because I think we read this, but we miss some of these words here. We miss some of the incredible doctrine. When Jesus comes to the Americas, the first thing he does is he announces that the atonement is complete and that he's fulfilled the will of his Father. He passed the test. He's done it. And then he says, verse 14, 3 Nephi eleven fourteen, Arise and come forth that you may thrust your hands into my side, 
that you may feel the nail, the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that you may know that I am the God of Israel, the God of the whole earth, and that I've been slain for the sins of the world. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. And this they did do going forth one by one. He is a one by one God. Amen. Now, maybe he spends, a, you know, I can imagine one by one, but then he runs out of time and then he can't do the whole congregation. But notice the second half of that. He is a one by one until they all God. Everyone gets his undevoted attention. Now, I struggled with that for a while in terms of when I pray and so many other people are praying, how can he possibly hear me? Until I read this quotation from C.S. Lewis that really changed my perspective. C.S. Lewis said, how can God attend to several hundred million humans, all who are addressing him at the same moment? Notice that the whole sting of it comes in the words, at the same moment. Most of us can imagine God attending to any number of applicants if only they came one by one and he had an endless time to do it in. So what is really at the back of this difficulty is the idea of God having to fit too many things into one moment of time. Our life comes to us moment by moment. One moment disappears before the next comes along, and there is room for very little in each. That is what time is like. You and I tend to take it for granted that this time series is not simply the way life comes to us, but the way all things really exist. We tend to assume that the whole universe and God himself are always moving on from past to future just as we do. But God is not in time. His life does not consist of moments following one another. If a million people are praying to him at 1030 tonight, he need not listen to them all in that one little snippet, which we call 1030. 1030 and every other moment from the beginning of the world is always present for him. He has all eternity in which to listen to the split second of a prayer put up by a pilot as his plane crashes in flames. God is not hurried along in the time stream of the universe. He has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. He does not have to deal with us in the mass. You are as much alone with him as if you were the only being he had ever created. He is a one by one God until they all. Now, if we go back to that verse, notice the verbs. They came forth one by one until everyone had done so, so that they could see, feel, know, and bear record. Everyone got a chance to see, feel, know, and bear record. But I would suggest we turn that around, that Jesus sees us one by one. Jesus knows us one by one. He feels our pain one by one. He bears record of us. He testifies to the Father of our goodness. Jesus sees us and feels us and knows us and bears record of us. On that, I just want to throw in one more scripture, Mike, if it's okay. Yeah, and not just our name, right? It's like he's in us. Like yeah. he, he knows what it's like to be Bryce. Just is, like is, your dream about your yeah. friend. The more you got to into his soul and in, into his mind, the more you loved him. Well, that's why Jesus loves us. I love this verse in Moses 7. Now, Enoch here is a type of Christ. And what Enoch goes through is what Mike went through in his dream and is what Jesus goes through with his Messiahship. This is Moses 7, 41. It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Enoch and told Enoch all the doings of the children of man. Wherefore, Enoch knew and looked upon their wickedness and their misery and wept and stretched forth his arms, and his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. Now, that's not a description of Jesus in Gethsemane, who looked upon our wickedness and our misery and our pain and our anguish, who saw us, felt us, and knew us, and then wept and stretched forth his arms, literally, And his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. That's Jesus. 
That's the man we celebrate this Easter season. Yeah. It's in Abinadi's words, and it's in Isaiah. There's a phrase in there where it says, and when his soul shall be made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And then Abinadi is going to explain who the seed are. So uh, Mosiah 15.10, I, I say unto you, who shall declare his generation? Behold, I say unto you that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And now what say ye? Who shall be a seed? So a couple things. The question to me, this is my reading of Mosiah 15.10. I take responsibility for this. I think what Abinadi is saying in the beginning of the verse where he says, who shall declare his generation? is who is going to declare the divine sonship of Jesus Christ, that he is a man and he is a God. His generation, that he comes from the heavens to atone for you, but he knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to sweat. If you're willing to be that person, you are his seed, if you declare his generation. And then in verse 11 and 12 and 13, that's his message, essentially. If you've heard the words of the prophets and you've followed them, and you've followed Jesus, and you love Jesus, you are his seed. Look at the end of verse 12. And now, are they not his seed? Verse 12, it says, these are they for whom he has died. That's my Jesus. That's who he is. And as we declare his generation, look at verse 14. These are they who have published peace, who've brought good tidings of good, who have published salvation and said unto Zion, thy God reigneth. The context of that verse is chaos. When your nation was fighting a war, we didn't have internet. We didn't have telephones. And so runners would be sent. That's where we get the marathon, right? The runner runs all those miles to declare that they've been victorious in battle. And that's what it means to publish peace. And right now we have thousands of missionaries out declaring his generation, publishing peace. In a way, Bryce, I'd like to think that in a small way, that's what we're doing here. We're declaring who he is. And when his soul was made an offering for sin, I believe he saw his seed. Elder Holland took it a little bit more personally where he said, he didn't just see you. Like he was you. He knew what you went through one by one. And I can't even, we're back to that time question Bryce is asking, like, how does that even happen? How is that even possible? And in my small mind, I like to just think of maybe time slowed down, or maybe it was this concentrated revelatory expression where he just comprehended it. I just, I, in my mortal mind, I can't comprehend it, but I believe it to be true because I've experienced it. I've experienced that that's who he is. And so I just think that's really cool about who he is. Maybe that gave him courage to go through it, because when his soul was made an offering, that was not a fun time for him. Now, let, hold on, Mike. Let me, let me point out the doctrine that you just taught. It is one of my favorite doctrines in the gospel. Let's go back and read Mos- Mosiah 15.10. Behold, I say unto you that when his soul shall be made an offering for sin. When? Now, there's two ways to read the word when. One is after, after he's suffered in Gethsemane, he'll go into the spirit world and he'll see his seed. Or the way Mike's declaring it, while, while he was suffering, he saw his seed. Now, hold on. We all know that Jesus has an off switch. He can turn this pain off at any moment. Why didn't he? Why didn't he end the pain? It's because he saw you, and he knew what quitting early would do to you. So may I suggest a very profound thought to each one of you listening? Jesus is the one that gets us through our dark moments. Who got Jesus through his dark moment? You did. The thought of you kept him going. You got Jesus through the atonement, every one of us. He saw his seed. And just like he gets us through our darkness, we got him through his. I got him through his. You got him through his. That's the sacred relationship between you and Christ. Your memory, your thought, your life got him through. And so 
I love that line. There's a, we sing a hymn, hymn number 187, God loved us so he sent his son. There's a, the, a third verse in there that says, O love effulgent, love divine, what debt of gratitude is mine, that in his offering I have part and hold a place within his heart. I hold a place in his heart. That's poetry. That's just beautiful poetry. And that's Jesus. And that's the intimate relationship we have with him. He needed us to get him through. And our lives got him through. And we need him to get through. We see this in families. Uh, today I was I was going outside. I had some time and I ran into a, a sweet sister in my ward. And she was out with her husband and she was with her parents and her parents are living with her right now. And I thought she's doing for her parents what her parents did for her. And I see this horizontal relational grace, but yet it's also like the cross of Jesus. It's vertical. Like we cry out to God and God says, if you want to know the vertical, know the horizontal, have, build these relationships, cultivate these horizontal relationships and you'll come to know the heavenly and we pray and the heavens come down. And like my experience with my dream, I cried out for grace and it changed my horizontal relationship and they're reciprocal and they interact with each other. And it's it, like, it's like the cross of Jesus. And it's just powerful. Cross. Yeah, it's beautiful. Think about your kids. Think about how you feel about them. Like every good thing in that relationship, that's Jesus. Yep. Okay, let's go to Luke 5. And while we're in Luke 5, let's do um, the man full of leprosy. Okay. Uh, by the way, Bryce, this is awesome. <laughs> okay, Luke 5. Because it's Jesus. It's, it's it, Jesus. I could talk about Jesus all I day. I could do. And it's, the Spirit is like making me cry. Okay, Luke 5. I like this on so many levels. First of all, um, one of the reasons I really like it is I just think that Simon is just a regular dude. I just see him as just a man who is the, the, the Roman government has crippled these guys with taxes and they just got to work so hard. I mean, just imagine working 14, 15 hour days to just feed your family. And anyway, that's kind of how I picture uh, Simon here. So uh, Luke 5, verse 1, it says, It came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake, the Sea of Galilee, essentially. So Jesus has all these people. And verse 2 says he saw two ships standing out by the lake, but the sh fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So they're calling it a day. They've had a really horrible day. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out to the deep and let down your nets and you're going to get this big catch he says and simon in verse five and i just totally relate i i see simon as a man of evidence and he's like bro yeah you're a holy man go do your holy man stuff because i'm a fisherman and there there's nothing and we know fish and yeah. you the yeah. carpenter you don't know fish you don't know nothing and so, so typical of human behavior. I, I can't I know <laughs> what's best for me yeah. and throwing my nets on the other side not I, I can't even tell you guys how many times I've had like Simon's attitude where I'm like, I, I, I got this, Lord. I, let me run my life. Just get out of my way. If you would just give me what I want and just kind of let me do my thing. So verse five, we, Master, we've toiled all night and there, there's nothing happening. But nevertheless, and I can almost see a sigh. Nevertheless, maybe an eye roll. At thy word, I'll let down the net. And when the, this they had done, they closed a great multitude of fishes and their net broke. If you go to verse 11, the net breaking caused them, and that's the key, that's the ticket, verse 11. They brought their ships to land and they first took all and followed him. It was such a powerful experience in their life that they literally gave it up to follow Jesus. Verse 7, they beckon unto their partners when they're, the ship's full of all, the, you know, the net's full of all this fish, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled the, both of the ships up that they began to sink. So two boats filled with fish, they're sinking. And Simon, named Peter, is going to fall down at Jesus' feet. And he's like, okay, you're not just a guy, but I am. And that that's the Jesus that I love. Like, I see him as a guy who says, I know you're just a guy, but that's okay. You're enough. 
because with me, you're going to do it. And I love it because he meets him where he is. He comes to where Simon hangs out. And it's that story. Is it Bishop Monson when he goes to the garage and there's that grease covered kid in the pit working on cars? He comes to this kid who's working on cars on Sunday and he's covered in grease. And he says, we miss you at church. Um, I love this. I love this story because of that. But then what's interesting is, um, and this is the other side of it. Yeah, he knows him. But then he says in verse 10, I'm not here to talk about fish. I want you to catch men. There's a better catch. And he asks him to do something really hard. And I think we're back to this relational Jesus. Yes, he knows you. Yes, he loves you. And he's going to give you grace. But he's going to ask something of you. And he wants you to come. And he wants you to give it all. And to me, that's family. To me, that's everything that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ requires. For me at 19, it was... I know you're at the prime of your life and you have a scholarship. Go on a mission. I love that C.S. Lewis said that God is easy to please and hard to satisfy. Yeah. And I think that's the idea is I accept you for who you are. You don't have to be anyone else but yourself, but I'm also going to push you further. I love that story. And I love what comes next. If you look at verse 12, a man full of leprosy approaches the Savior. Now, think of leprosy as a symbol of sin. Just like leprosy, sin eats us alive slowly over time. It deadens our sensitivities. Um, We just fall apart, much like a leper did. And here's a man full of leprosy. Imagine in Jesus' day, if you walked into a crowd and said, hey, I'm a leper, what would they do? And isn't that what we expect Jesus to do when we approach him? I mean, here's Peter saying, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He, I expect you to not want to be with me. And so here's a, a, a man full of leprosy, and he approaches Jesus, and he doesn't even have the courage to say, Lord, can you cleanse me? He doesn't even have the courage to ask. He says, hey, Lord, if you want to, you could make me clean. I just don't know if you want to. Now, how many of us are just like that? I know he could. I just don't know if he wants to. And I kind of expect him to run the other way when I approach him. When I kneel down in prayer, I expect him to run away. And then he does what no one's supposed to do to a leper. He runs towards him, and he touches him. And then he says, I will. Meaning, I want to. That's Jesus. I want to be in your life. I want to help you. I take you for what you are, and I want to help you be better. That's Jesus. I love that one. That's good. Two more, really quick. Um, Back to the names, like he knows me. I just want to issue this challenge to you, the listener. Next time you go to the temple, do someone's name from beginning to end and just listen to the name. How many times that name is uttered in his house. That's powerful. I remember having that experience pairing that experience with a spiritual experience. And it just, it was visceral. Like it went through me and I was like, we're back to this. He knows these people and they're not dead to Jesus. And so that, that was a neat experience, but I want to close out with this idea of polar opposites. There's this ideal of acting for yourself. Hey, we need to do it on our own and pull up our bootstraps and work hard. And, and there's another opposite end of this spectrum that says, What about the people that need help? We have a moral obligation to help many people who are in need of help. Yeah. For me, I see Jesus, the good in both of these ideals, that he is a a man of action. And we did a whole podcast on this, so I'll be brief. But in 2 Nephi 2, to me, one of the main messages of 2 Nephi 2 is, do you want to be happy? Then act. Jesus is a being who acts. And even in his name, Yahweh literally means he who causes things to be, or the one that creates. 
And so in 2 Nephi 2, there's all these verses that talk about acting. And so I'm just going to read a couple of them. Verse 26, the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. And over and over again, there is this ideal of acting for yourself. Look in verse 16, wherefore man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by one or the other. And over and over again, the context of 2 Nephi 2 is Adam and Eve, and they're brought into this world of opposites, and they have to make choices. And the the message of 2 Nephi 2, at least one of them to me, is God is a being who acts. And yet in that ideal of him acting and inviting us to participate in this gospel message, and I really do think it's participatory, in the acting, he wants us to give grace. He wants us to lift the leper. Um, In the Old Testament, he's the God of widows and orphans, and that is hammered in the prophetic writings of the Old Testament. And so if I'm going to follow Jesus, yes, I need to act. I need to be this person who does things, but... And I'm holding out my other hand here. <laughs> From my other hand, it's participatory. I must be someone that is redemptive. I must be like Jesus to the degree in which I can. I think the good in all of these voices is Jesus. And the gospel is this middle way. It's this, it's this hodos. It's this path. And it's straight and it's narrow. And it incorporates all the things that are good. I, I hope that, that makes line. sense. I love that. I love that concept. I'm going to throw one last one in on my side. If you'll turn to Doctrine and Covenants section 3 and picture yourself as Joseph Smith and you've just lost the 116 pages. I mean, talk about an egregious error. Talk about a major mistake. You've lost scripture that men gave their lives to preserve, and you've lost it. And the Lord warned you. He told you repeatedly, don't do it, Joseph, don't do it. And you ignored his warning, and you insisted, and so he let you, and you've lost Scripture. Can you imagine the distance between God and Joseph? And he must have felt it. This is a big mistake. Now, watch God pull this young man in. And I don't know what mistakes you've made, but just picture being Joseph Smith, the mistake you've made and the distance between you you and God is great. So let's start in section 3, verse 4. Notice how he refers to Joseph. For although a man may have many revelations... Now, there's no question who the man is, right? But interesting choice of words. He refers to Joseph as a man, as if that man way over there, far away from me, although a man may have revelations and have power to do many mighty works, like you, Joseph... If he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will, his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. So Joseph is way out there. Amen. Him. And then verse 5. Ready? Watch what Jesus does. He pulls him in. Behold, you, you have been entrusted. How strict were your commandments? Remember the promises that were made to you if you did not transgress. Verse 6, how oft have you? Notice what he's doing. Joseph goes from being a man to you. And then verse 9, behold, thou, thou art Joseph. That's, such, that's Jesus pulling us in. When we've made a mistake, it just pulls us in. The distance between us, a man, you, and thou. Thou art Joseph. Thou was chosen to do this. And then verse 10, thou art still chosen and are again, art again called to the work. Boy, that little moment is so typical of Jesus and the man that I love and the man that I worship, who when I commit sins and feel like I'm far away from him, he just, 
He, he pulls me into his soul. And that's why I want to be a better person. That's why I want to do what's right. It's because he loves me. And I just love that moment in church history. I think that's such a typical moment for all of us that a man, you, thou. He pulled him right into his bosom. That's so good. I love that we've been able to have this experience to look at the text and see who he is. If you've had personal experiences illustrating any of these principles, talk to your families about them. And I just want to testify of everything that we've talked about. Uh, He's real. And I love how the revelations of the restoration paint this portrait of who he is. And so with that, uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful week.